So go ahead, Gopi. Over to you now. Oh. Now, the next part, like um, we have seen a little bit of uh, packet flow yesterday, that uh, how packet can be moved from system A to system B, and what is the functionality of R, and a couple of messages related to ICMP protocol. Now, let's get into the next level on this. Um, like, if a machine has an IP address like A, 10.0.0.10, and B has an IP address of 10.0.0.20. Now, the point is how these IP addresses can be associated with the machine. How can you configure the IP addresses to a machine? There are two different methods. One is a manual method. The second one is automatic method. Manual method is going to be so simple to do the configurations. Every machine you have to go and get into the settings, I'll be configuring the IP addresses. When it comes to automatic, it's quite possible that the user may be roaming within the campus or he may be visiting offices. Uh, today, he may be in one location. Tomorrow, he may be visiting a different location. In that case, if I do manual configuration, it will become very tedious job for the user. Every time, every time he moves out from one place to another place, he may need to contact the IT support to do the changes, right? He has to change the IP addresses and all. So instead of that, it would be better to go with the automatic. When it is automatic, as the user is moving to a specific environment, the IP addresses will also be changed accordingly. So assume that you are working in the campus, the college campus, you're sitting in building number one, now you are moving to building number two. The IP address will also be changed according to the building on which you are working now. So that's the benefit of getting into automatic. Now, first I will show you how do you configure the manual configuration, the manual um, IP address assignment. And then I will discuss about the automatic and we will see how this automatic configurations is going to be happening, all right? So how many of you have done the IP configurations? Anybody have done? No, no. Uh, okay. All right. Now, in that case, I would recommend someone to share the screen with Windows machine. I can show you from the Mac if you prefer to see from the Mac. Windows will be a little simple to uh, see the configurations details and all. Uh, can we expect John? Uh, thanks, Jan. <laughs> Even before I ask you. <laughs> I think you understood. All right. Um, on the bottom of bottom right of your desktop, can you see the wireless symbol over there? Ah, you can go like that also. Ah, right click on that. Right click. Open network and uh, internet sharing. Now select that wireless uh, change adapter options can you see that advanced network settings on the right side of it below properties uh, next about that um, about that about that change adapter options uh, choose that wi-fi right click properties which the Wi-Fi part? Wi-Fi part. Okay. Uh, yes. Right click. Properties. Now uh, here we can see IPv4, TCP IPv4. Can you see that from the top fourth item? One, two, three, fourth item. Internet protocol version four. Yes. Properties. Now, can you see that one? Use the don't choose now. Uh, if you say uh, use the following IP address, can you see that option? Yeah. Obtain an IP address dynamically. Don't say okay now. Uh, click that one. Click that. You can choose that one. Right until you, the moment you click okay, you will be losing the internet connection now because um, 
uh, you will be you will be you will be pulled out uh, you will be pulled out from the meeting also because it, the settings are going to be taking effect once the, in the once the settings are applied only then you will be able to get connected to it but this is where you will be able to configure the ip address subnet mask and the default gateway for a windows machine right don't say okay say cancel but before you click on the cancel please wait and uh, uh, wait 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 on the above option obtain an IP address automatically. This is the option we have chosen. The meaning of this is, this is going to be receiving an IP address dynamically, and the, the, the received IP addresses are going to be configured to this adapter dynamically. We'll see how this is going to be happening. Now say cancel, don't click OK. Yes. Now, even if I've, um, I chose this one, I can still say OK, right? It doesn't matter. No, 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 don't do that one. Now, don't do that, because you are inside the class, right? Okay. It wouldn't be happening anything. It wouldn't be do happening anything. But uh, if the new request has been given, and if you're not getting the IP address on time, then you will be not you will not be connected to the internet for for few seconds. Then automatically you will be left from the meeting. Also, I don't want that to happen. Why I'm giving the demo? All right. All right. Yeah. Cancel. Okay. Now you can stop the share. Now, let me go back. My share. Oh, so manual configuration may look simple, but you need to have the admin rights. As a user of the machine, if you have the admin rights, only then you will be able to modify those IP addresses and all. But when it comes to automatic, right, it is going to be simple. All you have to do is what choose the automatic IP address configuration. But if at all this has to happen, there is one server we used to call it as DHCP server. Now, what this DHCP server will do is it will take the configuration details from the system administrator who is responsible for distributing the IP addresses within an infrastructure according to the segment the user belongs to. When a user is connecting, the DHCP server will be releasing an IP address for him. Okay, take this IP address. This is your subnet mask. This is your default gateway. This is your DNS server. Those kind of informations are going to be shared by this DHCP server. If at all this has to happen, there is a protocol called as what DHCP. DHCP is nothing but a dynamic post configuration protocol. This is the protocol. So what this DHCP or dynamic host configuration protocol will do is if the client has been configured to get an IP address dynamically, IP address and rest of the configurations dynamically, the DHCP protocol is going to be sending the message like, I'm interested, I would like to have an IP address. The user has requested me to take the IP address dynamically, right? The DHCP server, upon receiving this information, it is going to be releasing an IP address from a specific set of pool from where the user is connecting to, right? So when this uh, release is happening, the user may take an advantage or other may, may take a chance whether he would like to take this IP address assigned by the DHCP server or not. If he is willing to take that configuration, then he will be requesting DHCP server will confirm that the assignment of IP address for the client. And this whole process, we call it as DORA, right? The overall process of sending this request for getting the IP address, confirming the IP address, what has been uh, what has been received from the DHCP server, the whole process is known as what DORA. It's nothing but the first character of four different packets: discover, offer, request, or register, acknowledge. These are all the four messages which are going to be exchanged between the client and server to receive the IP related configurations dynamically from the DHCP, uh, dynamically via DHCP protocol. What is discover message? When the client machine boots up, right? When the client machine boots up, it needs to have an IP address, but the user has been configured this machine to get the IP address dynamically. First of all, he needs to know where is my DHCP server? For that, the DHCP discover message has been transmitted, right? So the discover message is to identify who is the DHCP server. This is the main intention of it. 
when this discover message has been sent on the network as a broadcast, DHCP server will also be receiving it. And why would someone in the world will be looking for my presence, right? So he can understand that somebody is trying to find me mean. He is interested in getting the IP address configurations dynamically from me. So I'm offering, right? I'm offering the IP and the configurations, IP related configurations, if I have something configured on me. Assume that the DHCP server has been configured to release the IP addresses for the users, then he will be sending those details, config, IP related configuration details to the user. Now, it's quite possible that in an environment, you may have more than one DHCP server. It is quite possible the user may be receiving this IP related configurations from more than one DHCP server. Quite possible, right? So now what the user will do, what the machine will do is, as a first come first serve basis, whomever, whichever the server has released the IP address related configurations to me first, I will be accepting it, right? Choose the offer to accept it. That's where the request or register comes into picture. Somebody has given the offer. Just because I have received the offer message, it doesn't mean that I have to take it up. Think about your getting job offer, right? One of the company, you attended an interview, you got a job offer. Just because you got the job offer, it doesn't mean that you have to take it up. It's of your choice. So they have given you the offer. You may consider it. If you are considering, if you believe that the offer is good for you, then you will be going and joining with the company, right? So while you're joining, a joining letter will be there. Similarly, there might be, even if it is a single offer, the, the, the user mission needs to um, request or register or accept this particular offer message. So the user has accepted to uh, use the IP configurations shared by the DHCP server upon receiving this message, acknowledgement is going to be confirming the IP related configurations to the user mission. So these are all the four messages which could be exchanged between the client and the server for the DHCP operation. The benefit of this is what as a user you're sitting at home now, you may be going to office, you may be going to your partner site or maybe visiting someone else. Whichever the network, the PC or the laptop or the endpoint is getting associated to, the IP related configurations can be dynamically associated to the user machine. Then the machine could be part of that network where the user is connecting to. That's the advantage of this. I will show you a small demonstration of this, right? Give me a minute. I'm just connecting to my setup. I'm just in, uh, initializing the setup so that we will be able to practice it.
Okay. Now I just made the setup. I'm just going to be sharing the screen to you now. Okay. Sign it to this thing, eh? Hold up. Sorry. Sorry. All right. My screen is visible for you now. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. No, don't worry about the setups and all. So I'm just using a setup where this demonstrations could be done. So you see that there are two different routers here, right? So the icon which says that four different arrow marks. Can you see that one? This is the router, right? So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be making one of the device as a DHCP server. And the other device is going to be getting the IP address dynamically from that DHCP server. This is the idea, right? So let's make one of the server, one of the device as my DHCP server. How do I do this one? We'll see that. All right. The first thing, what I'm trying to do is I'm configuring an IP address for the interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. That's what I'm doing first. Interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. IP address is 10.0.0.1255.0.0.0. And then no shutdown. So the interface for me, it is in upstate. Now what I have to do is I just need to make sure that um, the DHCP service or DHCP server is configured for that. So I'm just taking the help of a command called as what DHCP, IP DHCP. Um, server. IP DHCP. Oh, can you see this, the pool? This is where I will be able to define the range of IP addresses that could be associated. If somebody is asking for the IP address, I should have the reserve, right? The pool is nothing but the reserve of IP addresses which has been given. So uh, uh, as an administrator, I know what would be the range of IP addresses I would be having it. And from that, I can associate a set of IP addresses in the pool. When the pool um, is created and the service is running on the DHCP server and somebody is asking for the IP address, it can be releasing it. So let me call this as IP DHCP pool, um, pool one. Now here, this is where the definition of IP schemes, definition of the other parameters, see here, what and all I have it. <clears throat> Don't worry about the commands. You no need to worry about it. Network. Now, what is the range of IP addresses? Let me say 10.0.0.0. This is the network. The subnet mask is slash 8. Right? And then I'm not going to be configuring anything else. What I'm saying that if a client is asking for the IP address, you can take an IP address from this pool and you may be releasing it to them or you may be offering it to him. But anyway, I have taken one of the IP address from this pool and associated to that interface. I just need to make sure that that IP address is not released. I'll tell you, give me a minute. I'm just showing you here so that it will be easy for you. See, what I have done. Let's assume we have. This is my router and an interface called as fast ethernet 0 slash 0 has been configured with an IP address of 10.0.0.1. And this is where I'm defining the DHCP pool as what? 10.0.0.0 slash 8. That means from this pool, any IP addresses can be shared if the client is requesting for it. But 
anyway this ip address 10.0.0.1 which got associated to the interface class ethernet 0 slash 0 through which this router could communicate with the whole network has been part of this ip segment i don't want the dhcp tool to release or to offer this ip address which has been used already to any of the requested client for that what we normally do is okay i have defined the range of ip addresses but i would like to exclude an ip address from the offering range that's what i'm trying to do now IP DHCP. Can you see uh, excluded address? See? Excluded address. Can you see this excluded address? I don't want this address to be released to any. That's all. So I defined the range. I also mentioned one of the IP address not to be released to or not to be offered to any of the requested client. Other than that, all I have to do is what? just need to start the DHCP service. That's it, over. So I configured a pool. In that pool, I defined the network. From that network, I don't want one of the IP addresses to be offered to any of the client because that IP address, I'm using it. Then I have started the DHCP service by giving the command service DHCP. Now you can go ahead and say that show IP DHCP offerings. You can see that. Any of the IP addresses given to any of the person? I know there is a pool. I know that it is ready, but there must be a client who has to be asking for that IP address. That is our next step. Now let me go back to my setup. Let me start connecting to this machine. Just wait for a couple of seconds so that the process will complete. Call this as a PC. Now, interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. I'm just enabling this interface. Then I'm saying that I'm asking this device to get the IP address from the DHCP server, right? Nothing else. I would like to configure an IP address for this interface via DHCP protocol. Say this one and wait for a while. Let's see whether this guy is capable of getting the IP address or not. Show IP interface brief. Waiting for it. Can you see that an IP address has been taken? Can you see that? Right? DHCP address assignment interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 assigned DHCP address of 10.0.0.2 where the subnet mask of 255.0.0.0, host name is PC. Now, this IP address has been assigned to this interface via DHCP server. Can you notice that the IP address is received? Similarly, if I go and check the DHCP server, check for the IP address assignment, can you see? 10.0.0.2 has been associated to so and so person. How this got associated? Automatic. Automatically, an IP address has been assigned to the user via the DHCP server. That's the idea. So the IP address can be configured manually and the IP address can be configured automatically. Here's the logic. Any questions on this part? No? My audible? Oh. Am I audible for all? I'm not very sure. Yeah, audible, Mr. Gopi. Oh, okay. I just trying to process the information. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Just share. Uh, if I here. may ask to drill this down to in the real world uh, scenario in an office. What you're saying is for an IP address to be assigned to a machine or to uh -huh. a PC, it uh -huh. can be done manually or automatically, right? Yes, yes. 
Um, so the you just explained the automatic part. Is that it? Uh -huh. The manual bit, how is that done? Or maybe I missed it in your explanation. But manual explanation, I think I have shown you from the uh, John's machine, no? Oh, okay, okay. The, the first one that, okay. Ah, yes, yes. Okay. That is the first one I have demonstrated. Okay, okay. It's in John's machine. Okay. Right. So manual configuration is not being practiced currently in many of the organizations because many of the organizations, they have given um, a laptop, right? A mobile device. Um, the user may be moving from one place to another place along with his PC. So manual IP configuration is not recommended from the user's perspective. When it comes to the servers, and it's a data center and you have the server, by that time, the servers are going to be configured with the static IP addresses. By that time, we take the help of manual configuration. Even then, even for the server scenario, you can go for dynamic association of IP addresses. It's quite possible, right? But every time the server is coming up and asking for the IP address, the same IP address will be assigned from the DHCP server. That is also possible. But here we are trying to understand what is DHCP. That's all. All right. The next part, hope oh, it is clear. I'm just moving on to the next level. <clears throat> now, you also need to understand something called as a routing table. Hope you may remember yesterday, we have taken a command called as a route print from uh, Joseph's machine, right? What basically we were trying to do, a route print. What route print will do? It will display uh, list the routing table entries. Now, what is this routing table is all about? This is the table which will be consulted when the communication is going to be initiated by the device. Okay, I would like to talk to you, right? By that time, do I know how to reach you? How do I know about it? I will consult my routing table to understand whether the destination is reachable or not. To have this routing table, Right. There are certain conditions. An interface must be configured with an IP address. That's the first condition. The second condition that interface must be in upstate. Only then the routing table can be initialized. And what will be there in the routing table? Every network that is connected directly. The networks which are connected directly to a device will be there in the routing table. Now, again, I'm just going back to my device, a router. I will show you. I have this router. I have this PC or anything. Now, if I would like to see the routing table, I already shown you the interface configuration. See, show IP interface brief. Now, you see that. The interface status is up and it has been configured with an IP address. So this device will have a routing table got initialized. Now, how do I view the routing table here on this particular device? I take the help of a command called as show IP route. Can you see this entry? 10.0.0.0 slash 8 is directly connected via fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. So this is the interface through which the 10 network is connected. If I would like to talk to anyone in 10 network, I just need to simply forward the packet out via fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. That is the understanding of this particular entry. Now, let me say I'm going to be having an another interface. Configure terminal. Interface loopback 0. IP address is 11.1.1.1.255.255.255.0. Right? All I have done is I have an another interface configured. Don't worry about this configurations part and all. I just wanted to show you how this routing table is going to be populated. See, now I have two interfaces configured. One interface is 10.0.0.1. The other interface is 11.1.1.1. Both the interfaces are in upstate, right? The condition is true. In my routing table now, I can see two entries, one for 10 network, one for 10 network and one for 11 network. 
Now, if this device has to forward the packet to any of the endpoints in 10 network, it will send the packet out via fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. If the device would like to send the traffic to any of the endpoints in 11.1.1.0 network, then it will be forwarded out via loopback 0. Is this clear? Is this clear? Any questions on this? Don't worry about the commands and configurations, which is not necessary for us to understand in this section. Right? Here, we are trying to understand the concept. What is the DHCP server? What is a, a routing table? Right? So the routing table is nothing but the table with a list of entries, with a list of destination, with a list of prefixes. If the device would like to talk to those destinations, how the traffic can be forwarded to that particular destination is what mentioned in, what is it called? My routing table. Okay. See, the routing table versus a routing process is different. What I say that routing table, every device which has an IP address configured for an interface and the interface is an upstate will have the routing table. Right, but routing is nothing but forwarding the traffic between the segments or the networks is what we call it as routing. Right, so what happens if you have T? Yesterday, you remember we have seen a scenario. I have routed PCA and PCD. I took the help of a router, right? And that connects system A and system B. And I have the IP address associated as 10.0.0.10. This guy is 20.0.0.10. And I configured an IP address for the router interface connecting to 10 network as 10. 0 .0 0.0.1. The interface which is connecting to the 20 network was 20.0.0.1. Now this guy has a routing table. PCA and PCB also has a routing table. But who can do the routing? Only the router with the process running called as forwarding can receive the traffic from one network and forward the traffic out via the other in, other network, other interface to reach the other network. Whereas these guys, they don't do routing. They simply consult the routing table when they are creating the traffic and it has to be forwarded to the destination. If the route is there in the routing table, it will be forwarded. Whereas routing is the process, receive the traffic from one network, forward the traffic to another network using the routing table again is through the help of a process called as IP forwarding. Right? Routing is a different process from a routing table. But both the cases, routing table will be consulted. Is that clear? Is that is the difference between routing and routing table is understandable? Yes. All right. Now, what if you have multiple entries in the routing table? Let's say that I have some of the entries on the router. Okay. I have the routing table of router. Let's say 10.0.0.0 slash 8 is via fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. 20.0.0.0 slash 8 is connected via fast Ethernet 0 slash 1. I also have an another entry made statically or dynamically somehow. Uh, it has a next stop address of what? Um, 20.0.0.1. Let's say this as the subnet mask of slash 24. 10.1.0.0 slash 16 as the gateway as 20.0.0.0. Let's assume like this. Now, what happens? 10.1.1.100 slash 32 going to the 20.0.0.0. Now, let's say this is the routing table entries of the router. It has four different entries, right? 10 network. 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network, 10.1.0.0 slash 16 network, and 10.1.1.100 slash 32 network. That means 
four different entries related to the 10 network are available in my routing table. In this case, how the decisions will be made if the router receives the traffic for a specific IP address. Let's say that now the router has received and it has to forward the packet to 10.1.1.100. Is 10.1.1.100 is part of this network? Yes, it is part of the network. So this can be used for forwarding. Is 10.1.1.100 is part of this network? Yes, it is part of that network. So the packet can be forwarded to 20.0.0.1. The 10.1.1.100 is part of this network? Yes, it is part of 10.1.0.0.16. Then what I have to do? I have to forward the packet to 20.0.0.0.0. In 10.1.1.100, there is a specific match also, the 10.1.1.100. Now, what the router will do if multiple entries that could be matched against the received packet for forwarding, whichever the entry has longest prefix. What is that longest prefix? The subnet mask is what we are calling it as a prefix. Whichever, when you have multiple matches, when you have a single match, you don't need to worry about anything. When you have multiple matches, the traffic may be forwarded, so not traffic may be, the traffic will be forwarded with an entry which has the longest prefix. You no, know, 8, 24, 16, 32, all of them are matching. Which one is the longest one out of all these four? The only two 32 is. Yes, exactly. Now, let's assume that the packet is going to 10.1.101. Now, three entries are matching. The fourth entry will not match, right? So, this will also match. This will also match. This will also match. Now, in this case, which entry will be used for making the forwarding decision? 8, 16, or 24? 24. 24 will be used because the prefix length is longest. Got it? Is that clear? So the no, it's, not, it's not clear, Mr. Gupi. I don't know if you can okay. take it. Okay, okay. See here. Thank you. Now, the router is receiving the traffic. The router is receiving the traffic. It has to forward the uh, forward the uh, traffic according to the routing table. Now, the received packet has a destination IP address of 10.1.1.100 is what the example I took. All right? Now, what happens when the router is consulting the routing table, it concludes that there are four entries which could be used for forwarding the traffic. So this is also matching, this is also matching, this is also matching, and this is also matching. There are four entries in the routing table which is matching for the received packet. In this case, what the router will do? Will it use this entry or this entry or this entry or this entry to forward the packet. When more than one entry is matching for the received packet to be forwarded, whichever the entry has the prefix length, which is nothing but the subnet mask. If you have seen the video yesterday, what I have seen, it, uh, shared, I have explained you the subnet mask portion also. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Whichever the subnet mask or whichever the prefix length is a higher, which one is longer? 8 is longer than 16 or 16 is longer than 8? 16 is longer than 8. Okay. Now, in this case, we have longer. four. Yes, correct. In this case, we have four matching entries. Out of these four matching entries, which entry has the longest prefix? Correct? The last one. Because this yeah. has 32. 32. So, according to this entry only, the forwarding will be happening. When you have more than one matching entry in the routing table, the prefix length is going to be considered. Whichever the entry has more than one matching entry, right? Whichever the entry has the longest prefix length will be used for forwarding the traffic. Okay, now then what I have done is I just changed it 10.1.1.101. Now the router has to forward the packet to 10.1.1.101. In this case, this is matching, this is matching, this is matching, but this is not matching. 
That means I have three different entries matching for the received packet. Now, which of the entry will be used for forwarding? Out of these three entries, which entry 16. has the longest prefix? 8, 24. 16, and 24. So the packet is going to be forwarded according to this entry. So the packet will be forwarded to someone who has an IP address of 20.0.0.1. This is how. Sorry. Yes, 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 please. Yes, please. Why are you you're considering other uh, prefix, but you are not considering that of the second one that has twenty point zero, okay. twenty point zero zero. You know, this zero. is an IP address, right? This is an IP address. It could be part of a network, right? Mm -hmm. The twenty network. Do you think that the first octet is matching? Okay, I got you. All right. Thank you. This guy is a member of a network. He could be part of which of the group? He could be part of this group. He could be part of this group and he could be part of this group, but not this group and not this end. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is the idea. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yes, please. Well, why is the last one not part of it when they have the same network uh, okay. ID? See, let me say how this is going to be happening. Could you please spell out your name? B O L A, right? B O L A, yeah. Okay. Uh, and your uh, last name? I J I J J E E H O R H O R. Okay. This is your name. Let's assume that. Somebody is trying to hand over a parcel to Bola Ijaha. Let me say there is another entry which is used to identify a group of people. And last two characters can be anything. Let's say like this. Okay. So last name has five characters. And four characters can be anything. There is a change, right? Can you see this one? Mm -hmm. Now, a person is carrying a parcel where the name is Bola I J E H O R. How do you pronounce it? Jehor. Yes, correct. Okay. Now, a parcel is carried by a person. It has a name mentioned that to whom the parcel has to be delivered. It is mentioned exactly this Bola Jehor. But there is also two more group over there. Their first name is matching. The last name is also matching because I said the last two characters can be anything, right? Here? Yeah. So the parcel uh, has a name and the person also has a matching entry. But the parcel will be handed over to him or handed over to this group. Or handed over to this group. Yeah. The parcel has a specific name that Bola Jehar. So because of that, the parcel will be handed over to you only. Though these three entries are matching, it will be handed over only to you, not to anyone else. Now, if the parcel has a recipient name as what? Bola I J E H O E. Just for an example, don't mistake that. I'm just um, confusing your name. Okay. It's fine. Now, in this case, is this matching this entry? No. Is this matching this entry? Well, uh, yes, it can be because no. Yes, correct, correct. This can because also be matched. Right? Yes. Perfect. Yes. This can also be matched, right? Yes. yes. Okay. In this case, to whom the parcel will be given? To this or to this? To the first one. The first one. With two Why? X. First one, this, this one, right? This one. Yes. Why? Mm -hmm. Because minimal number of entries are there. So this is where the longest prefix comes into picture. So when I have slash 32, what I'm trying to say is all 32 bits of the given IP address needs to be matched. So if there is a specific match, that is going to be considered first before I consider anything else. This is an exact match of the given IP address, which is equivalent to the parcel has a given name of Bola Jehar. 
Does yeah. it make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this is how the routing tables are going to be processed. Okay. Give me a minute. Let me try to check whether the other setup is ready or not so that I'll be able to all right. Still, uh, Cisco is uh, having a downtime during the maintenance. They are doing the maintenance because of that. I'm not able to uh, log into my system, but that's okay. Fine. Let's do another thing. All right. Now, <clears throat> now, how these devices are going to be connected? One of the device I already given you the example. Whenever I put a circle, right? What it does? It is a router. When I say a router, it has the ability of routing the traffic. What do you mean by routing? It can receive the traffic from one network and forwards the traffic to the other network according to the routing table. But how multiple people can be connected in a single network? Say, for example, I have multiple devices. Let's say I have ECA. Let's all of them are connected to the same network. We have Bolan, we have John, we have Joseph, we have Rupi, right? We have Queen May, and we have Ubu. There are so many people, right? We are all connected to the same network. How do you provide connectivity to all the machines and they can talk to each other? They can also talk to the whole network. How it is possible? That's where we take the help of a device called as a switch. Right? The switch is a specialized device which will allow us to get connected. Think of this as a spike buster or power extender. What a power extender can do? On my wall, I have a single socket. I would like to connect multiple devices. I would like to connect my laptop. I would like to have my mobile phone charged. I would like to have a table fan, right? How do I connect them? I have a single socket. I would like to connect multiple devices. What do I do? I take the help of a power extender and then the power extender gets connected to the socket and the power extender may have multiple socket assume that i have a five socket one or three socket one now what i can do one of the device can be connected to one of the socket and the another device can be connected to another socket and the third device can be connected to third socket think of this socket and a switch this socket is a power extender here we can call this as network extender we can say like that now the pc are going to be connected to these switches Right? How many interfaces, how many ports, or how many sockets could be available on the switch? On a typical case, you can see 24 ports, right? You can see 24 ports, which means 24 devices can be connected together. If they're all in the same IP segment, right? If they're all in the same IP network, they can talk to each other. They don't need to take the help of a router. When do you need to take the help of a router? Whenever the traffic is moving from one network to another network, only then you need to take the help of a router. Until then, you don't need to have a router. Now, I can have 24 devices connected. But what if I have more than 24 devices? What do I do? What I can do is I can simply take the help of two switches and then connect them back to back. You know that you can also connect the PCs here. Now what happened? I can connect more than 24 devices on this. If all of these devices connected to the switches or in the same IP network, they can talk to each other, even though they are physically connected to a different switch because we have the switches connected back to back. Is that clear? Is this clear? Yes, sir. What is, what is a switch? What is a router? The switches can be connected back to back to increase the number of devices connected. Like this, I can also extend the switches like this. I can connect like this. 
I can cascade the switches, right? So that more number of devices that could be connected. Now, in my organization, I have many devices. Now, what I would like to do is, I would like to put the restriction like what? I would like to segment the network according to the department they belong to. I would like to keep all the devices of HR department in one segment. I would like to keep all the devices of finance department to another segment production department and another segment like this department wise i would like to segment it can i do that one yes i can do one of the ways what i can dedicate switches for hr switches for finance and switches for production so i can have dedicated switches for the devices to be connected from hr Dedicated set of switches can, to be used for connecting finance devices. Dedicated set of switches um, uh, for connecting production devices. Quite possible. But it is not that you will be having all the interfaces being used. Assume that I have two users in HR, five users in finance, uh, maybe 100 users in production because production is going to be high. So if I reserve one switch for the HR, where 24 ports will be available out of 24 ports only two devices are connected i'm wasting the remaining 22 interfaces can i say that i'm going to be using only two interfaces to the manufacturer can you remove the rest of the interfaces and reduce the cost it's not going to happen right so when you buy a switch with 24 interfaces you are paying for all 24 interfaces whether you are going to be using those interfaces or not, it doesn't matter. You have to pay for the whole. I bought a switch with the 24 interfaces. I'm just going to be simply using two interfaces. I'm wasting 22. Similarly here, out of 24, only five interfaces are being used. Five ports are being used. Remaining 19 ports are being wasted. Here, of course, I have hundred switch, hundred into hundred devices, I can connect multiple switches and then I can provide connectivity to hundred endpoints. Well and good. But here the interfaces are getting wasted. How do I avoid it? And why do I have to dedicate a, uh, why do I have to dedicate the switches for each and every department? Right? Because I want to segregate it. Is that possible without dedicating the switches for each and every department? Yes, that is possible. That is where we come up with a concept called as a VLAN, which is nothing but virtual LAN. Now, before I get into the virtual LAN, do you know what is LAN? Anybody? I, I think it's a connection within the same... Um... Perfect. Correct. Correct. Point. But it okay. stands for local area network so when i say local area network right connecting a set of devices within a specific area right you cannot go beyond that area that's where the local area network comes into picture assume that you have a campus right connecting all the devices within that campus i can call it as a lan i could do that one now when i say virtual lan a segment virtually i'm creating a lan within a lan so basically lan is nothing but a set of devices are connected within a specific area now i have a set of devices but i'm grouping them according to their functionality within their organization so hr devices i'm going to be logically segment them finance devices i'm going to be logically segment them uh, production devices, I'm going to be logically segmented. What is the benefit of it? Now, see here. Instead of, instead of dedicating the switches for each and every department, what I can do, I take the help of a switch, right? The switch can be used to form a LAN. I can logically segment this switch. And this is one LAN. This is for, meant for another land. This is meant for another land. And this is how the segmentation is going to happen using a single switch, which is called as a VLAN. I can create a VLAN for HR. I can create a VLAN for finance. I can create a VLAN for a production. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, 
Okay. Yes, Mr. Gopi. Uh, but, but okay. sir, can I ask? Yes, please. When you have the VLAN for each of the departments, like you have in this diagram, uh, uh. all of them be connected to like a, uh, how do I say it now? Like a universal land where, I'm not sure how to explain huh. it. <laughs> okay. So they have they have to feed in from a particular uh -huh. source, right? Exactly. Now, while I create the VLAN, I also mention the interfaces which should be associated to this VLAN. So I may have a couple of interfaces reserved for VLAN HR, couple of interfaces for VLAN uh, uh, finance, and then the rest of the interfaces are associated to VLAN production. So any device which is connecting to this particular interface will be part of VLAN finance. Any device which is connecting to the interface associated to VLAN HR will be connected to VLAN HR network. Right? Similarly, any device connecting to these interfaces which are associated to VLAN production will be considered as they are part of production VLAN. Can they talk to each other directly? No, because this is a different network. This is a different network. This is a different network. Then you need to take the help of a router to achieve the communication to happen. Is it clear? So we can use a router in the same organization, right? Yeah. Because the picture yeah, I was having was that a router, you know, is only needed when uh -huh. it's for two different networks. Yeah, here it is a different network. VLAN, VLAN 1 is another network, VLAN 2 is another network, VLAN 3 could be different network. Well, they are all the if same the organization, right? Same organization. Within the organization, they are different, different networks. There is no condition set or there is no rule set. Like what? Every device of the same organization must be part of the same network. I'll tell you one of the example. If the companies are like what? Um, an infrastructure monitoring company. Say, for example, I have a company. I have recruited so many people and reserving a set of people for project one, which is uh, taking care of the infrastructure of Pepsi. Let's say that. I also have reserved a set of people. They are monitoring Coke, quite possible or not. They're all part of the same company and some of them are working for Pepsi and some of them are working for Coke. I don't want these two people to communicate with each other. I kept the members of Pepsi in one area, members of Coke in another area. So this is a separate land and this is a separate land. And even within that land, I can create the virtual land. Got the point? Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So, yes, it does. To, to uh, avoid um, conflict of interest or Chinese Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So um, now the virtualization has gone beyond the expectations and all. It's not that we can do the virtualization only on the switches. We can do the virtualization on the servers. We can do the virtualization on the routers, on the firewall. Any device that you have within your organization, virtualization is supported. The benefit of virtualizing a physical device into multiple virtual devices is what? You can avoid purchasing a dedicated set of devices for each and every functionality, right? each and every project or each and every department, right? You're getting my point? Yes, yes, oh, Mr. All right. Mm -hmm. all right, all right. Okay, now, <clears throat> what next? I know I'm just... Um, um, what you call it as overwhelming with a set of information, but we don't have it. I'm not giving you in depth of that because that is not required for this course, right? But anyway, we need to have a basic understanding on that. Similarly, you also have hubs, hubs 
we also have switches we know what we have seen and we also have routers we know what is that router and uh, we also have something called as wlc's and we also have ap's now ap is nothing but an access point is that gopi yes the hub and the switch are they not oh. the same thing no they are not the same oh, okay So the difference is what? Um, we say that hubs are multi-port repeaters, right? So what basically they do is it will allow multiple devices to be connected. But it looks the same, right? Switches also has multiple interfaces using which multiple endpoints could be connected. Right? This is what we have seen. The switches will allow multiple devices to be connected, correct? Then hub also, I'm saying that that is also helping us to connect multiple endpoints. So what would be the possible difference between them? Okay, right. Now, let me explain you so that you can easily understand the difference. Okay. But now, let's take a case. I have a hub. Let's say that this is a hub. Now, how these devices connected, that doesn't matter, we got the connectivity. A, B, C, B, E. Right? There are multiple devices connected. Now, A is trying to transmit the data to B. Okay, A is sending data to B. How it is going to be handled? Now, hub receives the frame. It will simply flood the packet out via all of the interfaces, right? But who will respond? I'm asking in the group, let's say that all of us are connected. I'm saying, Bola, that's what I'm saying. Bola, are you there? I'm Is here, it sir. audible to, no, 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 I'm just asking the example only. I'm asking a question, assume that A is me, B is you. I'm asking a question, Bola, are you there? Is it audible for, to the rest of the world? Is it audible to John? Is it audible to Joseph? Is it audible to the rest of the team? Yes, it is. Hmm. But who will respond? Bola. Only Bola will yeah, respond. Bola. That is the hub. But if you take a switch, right? Switch everybody. Sorry? No, go ahead. A, sir. B, C, D, and E. Now, what the switch will do? See, there is a process of convergence that will happen eventually. Once that happens, if the question is asked, right? The question is asked, are you there, Bola? Now, the switch will send the packet only to Bola. It will not be sent to any other interfaces because the switch can understand to whom the traffic has to be forwarded out. And that is happening through the help of a process called as Mac learning. You're getting my point? There is something called as what? Mac learning. By having this Mac learning process, switches will start learning about each and every device or endpoint Mac address connected to it. And it will use that information for making the forwarding decision. That's why we typically call switches as intelligent hubs. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. So the switch is preferred to hub, right? Yes. Mm. Okay. Switches are like hub, but just a more higher yeah, fashion. More, they are more intelligent. Intelligent, yeah. Okay. So, and also, according to the OSA layer, Hubs are acting at layer one and uh, switches are acting at layer, layer two. two. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. So what would be the need of, okay, now we know the hub, we know the switch, and we know the routers. And what is WLC and what is access point? Access points are considered as the wireless switch. How do you provide connectivity for multiple wireless devices? Now, what we do with the switches, the same thing we are doing with the access point. 
access point provides connectivity for the wireless clients. For the wired clients, you have the switches. For the wireless clients, you need to have a centralized device using which multiple endpoints could be connected and they can talk to each other. So that's why I typically say what? Access points are equivalent to the switches, but on the wireless front. Switches are providing connectivity to the wired devices. Access points provides connectivity to the wireless devices. Now, typically, when it comes to wireless, it uses a standard called as what? 802.11, right? So in the, wherever you see 802.11, they are talking about wireless. Wired 802.3. Right, 802.3 is related to wired, 802.11 is wireless. What is this 802.11? It's nothing but the standard, right? Any standard which is being developed and it will affect the wireless, which will be part of 802.11. Any standard which is being developed to, uh, which will affect something called a WiMAX, which will be part of 802.16, like that, for every set of communication, they develop the working group, and those working group are going to be identified in terms of 802 and something. Basically, it's nothing much. This project started in 1980, in the month of February. That's why 802, so that you don't forget. These informations are not necessary for your exams. And this is all our additional information, right? So 11 is the working group formed under 802 and which will be focusing only on wireless. Something like that. Something like this, there are so many working groups are there under 802 project and every working group is going to be responsible for certain activities related to a specific set of communication. Now 802.11a, 11b, 11c, like that, there are so many standards are there. Whatever, in, whatever starts with, whatever you see with 802.11 related to wireless, A may be related to something else, B may be related to something else, C may be related to something else, but all of them are talking about the wireless. <coughs> then what is that WLC? WLC is nothing but a wireless LAN controller. So what is the benefit of this? When I have an access point, a single access point. Now, think about your home. How you got connected to the internet? Are you using a DSL connection or you're using your mobile phone personal hotspot to get connected to this class? How you got connected? Hmm? How you are connected to the internet? Don't know. All right. Sorry? Are you talking about the Wi-Fi? Okay, I'm just telling you hereafter, don't use the term Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is not the right term. <laughs> Maybe you're wondering, as of today, you guys were using Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi to refer the wireless. But Wi-Fi is not the technology, first of all. <laughs> wireless is the technology. Then what is Wi-Fi? Why people are calling Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi and all? See, if you see any of the product, wireless product, they would have mentioned Wi-Fi, right? Any wireless product you buy, on the box, they would have mentioned Wi-Fi. What is that Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi is nothing but wireless fidelity. An organization who tests the features of the wireless products and approves that these products supports these features according to the standard or not. Like ISO. What ISO? International Organization for Standards Organization, right? Or International Standards Organization. Basically, ISO defines the standard. Similarly, Wi Fi can also define the standard. They validate whether the product supports all the features mentioned in the appliance or not. Okay. Wi Fi is not the technology, wireless is the technology. We started calling wireless as Wi-Fi. Okay, something like your Xerox. Xerox is a technology. Huh? Xerox is a technology or the product? No, it's a product. It's a product. But we started saying Xerox, Xerox, Xerox. Mm -hmm. Xerox is the company who came up with the product using which you can make the photocopies of the documents. Right? Ro Similarly, 
Wi-Fi is a company, is an organization who validates the feature of the product. They claim that they support. Once you see the Wi-Fi symbol on a product, you can trust the product. Yeah. Right? So wireless is the technology. WiMAX is also a technology. The wireless is for the short connection. WiMAX is for the longer wireless connection. If you like to throw the signal and cover it for longer area, you take the help of WiMAX. But anyway, now here, how you got connected, you have a wireless router at your home, right? If you have a single device, configuring that, configuring that single device would be so easy for you, right? Because only one device you have to affect. You know the coverage part of a wireless router? It is shorter distance. If you go little farther from the coverage area, you will not be connected to the wireless network at all. But in office, what would happen? It's a large building, right? It's a huge building, a campus, I have it. How do I provide connectivity to the whole area? It cannot be done with a single device. So I have multiple access points, right? So in this case, all of these access points needs to be managed. If I'm going to be managing these access points individually, and even a small change, I need to replicate. I do remember one of the projects which I did, uh, we have implemented more than 300 access points in that location, nothing but Hyderabad Airport, right? So more than 300 access points we have deployed over there. Now, how do I configure all 300 access points? How do I monitor them? How do I manage them? That's where this wireless LAN controllers comes into picture. Now, what you can do with this wireless LAN controllers, I can take the help of this uh, wireless LAN controller to do the configuration. And once the configuration is done, that can be pushed to all of these access points, right? If you want to push the configuration to all of the access points, you can do it. If you want to push the configuration to a set of access points in the group, I can do it. If you'd like to push the configuration to a specific access point, I can do it. What I mean to say, individual access point management, a set of access point management, all of the access points can also be managed at the same time. Right? This is going to be simplifying the configuration management monitoring of these devices could happen. You understand what I'm saying? Is this clear? Mm -hmm. The access points or the wireless switches. But to provide more coverage area, we may need more access points. As you increase the number of access points, managing them becomes complication. That's why we take the help of wireless LAN control. We can take the help of wireless LAN controllers to manage a group of access points together. Got it? All right. Now, so we have the switches, we have the firewall, we have the routers, we have the access points. Now, once you provide the connectivity, the communication within the organization can happen between the networks also because you have the routers. Now, my point is, if you'd like to put the condition like, uh, I don't want the HR department to access the finance server. I don't want the finance department to access the HR application, right? Like that, if you'd like to put the restriction, probably the, the top level management can have access to all the servers, right? Not the, 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 the L1 engineers should not be accessing this application. L2 engineers can access Active Directory, but not access uh, the other uh, radius and attack server. If you have those kind of requirements, would like to put the condition that is where you take the help of access control list. Now, what is an access control list? It's a list of rules that we will be writing. According to that set of rules, uh, the filtering of traffic is going to be happening, right? So access control list is known as what? A list of rules. Every rule is responsible for matching some traffic. Once the traffic is matched, what do you want to do with that particular traffic? For example, if you're entering into your office, do you have an access card? Why do they have an access card? Without an access card, an unauthorized person cannot enter into the office, correct? 
can anyone enter into your office no okay you have an access card correct mm -hmm. okay now every employee can enter into the office let's assume that within your office you have a data center let's assume like that can a finance person allowed to be entered into your data center he has an access card can you use that access card to open the data center no no okay that's where the access control list comes into picture right i have identified a set of people who can enter into the specific area right even though you are an employee you are an authorized person but still you are not authorized to enter into the specific place that can be achieved through the help of access control list got it now again this access control list got enhanced a lot later on now what they have done they have a standard access control list they have a uh, extended access control list they have a named access control list they have a dynamic access control list they have a reflexive access control list they have lock and key there are so many so many types of access control list to meet up the requirements of the customer but basically an access control list is nothing but a list of rules and every rule can identify some traffic and the identified traffic can be permitted or denied and these access control lists can be associated to the router where the traffic is going to be switched between the networks the router when it receives the traffic before it forwards or during the forwarding process it will check whether this traffic is allowed as per my access control list or not so access control list will help the organization to put the restriction who can access what got the point yeah question so Yes, who has, um, uh, if you want to have um, access to see um, the list of rules or, the, or to see the list of all the rules under the access control list, is there is it accessible uh -huh. when you are in a company or is it just the admin or those that are authorized? Whomever, whomever is accessing the router, whomever has access to the router, see? When they have access to the router, if they have given the privilege to execute the command, like what show access list, they can see the access list. Okay. All right. It's mm -hmm. not that anybody can see the access list. Okay. So even the use, the administrator can have the login to the router, but if the restriction is given, like what he cannot see the, uh, the whole set of configuration, then obviously he may not be in a position to see what access control list have been written. And it is not that you can have only one access list created on the router. You can create multiple access lists. And every access list is meant for some specific activity. I may be having one access list is bound to one entrance and another access list is bound to another entrance. I can do that. All right. As an enhancement, okay, I think it's better to get into the next topic by tomorrow. I believe that we have covered a lot today. <laughs> I have another question, Maybe. sir. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, please proceed do, with your is questions. it possible to show us um, visually to see a hardware of a switch? I know I'm familiar with uh, hubs, um, uh -huh. router, but switch. Oh, I don't know whether physically you want to see a switch? Means how yes. it looks like? Then okay. like yeah. Okay, give me a minute. I'm just showing you. Let me share the whole screen. So that... so Where did you that, see in your sorry, Samsung? Sorry, if, if as, as, we, as you teach or rather as you lecture, as you take us through, at times also, if you are bringing some visual pictures, it has a way of... Um, you know, making some of these things, a lot of the things you're saying to stay, to stick. All right. Well, this is a switch. Right? Hope the screen is visible for you. Yes, sir. Okay. Same way you have uh, access points. This is the one. You can see on the ceiling, some places you may be seeing on the wall, 
It depends on the place. This is the access point. And then you also have WLC. It looks like the same. If you take the firewall also, it will be the same. Until unless you see the product and take the console, you will not be able to confirm that. By seeing the product, little difficult to say. Because the WLCs can be inserted into the switches also. Anyway, fine. So this is my WLC. This WLC is going to be connected to the network using which connectivity the access points can be managed. So probably you would have seen the hubs. Oh, this is a hub. How do you differentiate the hub from the switch? Only functionality wise you can differentiate it. By seeing the product, you may not be able to differentiate whether there's a hub or switch. If you see some names over there, it's a hub, it's a switch. Probably you may say that. Okay. Hubs and switches will look identical. Mm -hmm. and... Router. This is hub. See, is this a router or a switch? <laughs> Only How one, many okay. uh, only one, yes. It's called as MLS, multi-layer switch. The routing process has been enabled on the switches itself. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Any questions you can ask me. Okay, uh, Mr. Gopi, just to double check on the VLAN. Uh -huh. So is the VLAN is like a, a network in a network, right? Huh. Like a room inside a house. Okay. Okay. Right. People may be renting out the room for someone else, like in Airbnb and all. We can say that we have an additional room, I can rent it out. Something like it can be given for someone else. Here in our case, what I'm trying to do is within the network, I'm segmenting the network. Every network may be based on the fund uh, functionality, may be based on the project, may be based on the requirement. You can slice your infrastructure into small, small chunks. That's what we call it as a VLAN. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, any other questions out there? Don't worry about the commands. Don't worry about the commands. All right, then there are no questions. I think I'm good for today. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Kobe. So, um, I'm going to stop the recording. I will upload the record when it's available. So, you got the recording, and uh, then you can watch it over, over again. If you have questions, tomorrow I will come. You will ask the questions. Okay.